First of all, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Lauren Harrington and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to today's AAVSO webinar. Now, we have a couple of excellent speakers lined up for you, but before we begin, I have a special announcement to make. This year, the AGSO is honored and thrilled to be celebrating its 110th year of citizen science and continuous stellar data. We want to give a huge thank you to everyone who's contributed to this accomplishment, both in the past and the present. We are especially excited to be celebrating our 110 years at an in-person spectroscopy workshop on November 3rd and 4th, and an in-person annual meeting November 5th through 7th in Somerville, Massachusetts. Our annual meeting will also have an online viewing option for many of its presentations, so that those of you who cannot attend in person can still enjoy the show. We are currently accepting presentation abstract applications from attendees who wish to give an oral or poster presentation on their research. So I implore you, please visit that link right there on the screen for more information on the spectroscopy workshop, annual meeting, abstracts, and to get to the registration links. All right, uh, next up, let's go through a little Zoom tutorial. Now, if you look down there at the bottom of your screen, you're going to see an icon which says Q&A. Whenever you have a question, all you need to do is click on the little Q&A icon, type in your question, and hit submit. Anyone is welcome to submit questions at any point during the presentation. So don't worry, it's not going to interrupt the presenter when you do. I will be behind the scenes, grouping and curating the questions as they come in. And after each presentation, I will read the submitted questions out loud so that the experts can answer them. Also, uh, this webinar for the first time, I'm going to be monitoring the Facebook live stream for questions as well. So if you're watching on Facebook, uh, please feel free to submit questions there. Next up, if at some point during the webinar, you experience technical difficulties with audio, we are unfortunately not able to help from here, but you may be able to fix your audio yourself. All you need to do is click on that little up arrow button that's by the mute icon in the bottom left of your screen, and then tinker around in the audio settings in the menu that shows up. Next, uh, automatic closed captioning is now available as part of our webinars. If you would like to show or hide this closed captioning on your screen, all you need to do is click on the little CC button down at the bottom of your screen and use the settings that pop up. Finally, we would like to thank and acknowledge our sponsors, DC3 Dreams and Voice Astro. DC3 Dreams provides high-end observatory automation and web-based multi-user remote imaging. The AAVSO Net Observatories use DC3 Dreams ACP Expert for the Bright Star Monitors, which you'll be hearing about today, <laughs> and other programs. The AAVSO Photometric All Sky Survey Project, also known as APAS, has used ACP Expert's AI scheduler to automatically acquire over 500,000 star fields, hands off, at a rate of 1,000 square degrees per night. This has resulted in photometry for over 128 million objects in about 99% of the sky. The Boyce Research Initiative and Education Foundation provides online astronomy education, observatory resources, and research experiences to students, student teams, and schools in order to learn how to perform observations, conduct research, and publish their results in scientific journals, such as the Journal of the AAVSO. Please check out their webpage to learn more about their work. Okay, now to kick off today's BSM Observing Section webinar, we will be hearing from two of the team's top experts, Mr. Ken Menzies and Mr. George Silvis. Mr. Menzies has almost half a million photometric observations in the AAVSO's databases, which is just incredible. And he's been teaching choice courses about how to use VFOT since 2015. Mr. Silvis actually helped to develop VFOT and is active in the exoplanet section as well as the BSM section. You'll be seeing him again in September when he gives his own webinar about exoplanets. Today, we are lucky enough to have both of these experts here to teach us all about the AAVSO's Bright Star Monitor Network and how we as observers can make use of these remote telescopes to collect beautiful, clear data. Okay, um, Mr. Menzies, Mr. Silvis, please take it away. Yeah, I think, do you need to unshare or? Yep, that's what I'm doing. 
and I will go ahead and share my screen. Okay. And um, Mr. Walker, you and I, let's turn off our video so that it doesn't block the slides. Yep. So it says you're sharing. Okay, we can see your screen share. Can you see mine now, Lauren? Uh, yep. Okay, great. Uh, good afternoon uh, for those of you here in the US. Uh, and uh, good evening for those of you in Europe and good morning for those of you in the Pacific. Uh, I'm Ken Menzies and I'm one of the AABSO Net, <clears throat> excuse me, management team members along with George Silvis, who's also here to assist with the uh, presentation. Uh, what I'd like to do uh, is to give you an idea of how the AABSO Net might help you collect some in images uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, you may be a new member, you may not have a telescope. Uh, you want to learn a little about variable star photometry. You might be an observer who would like to monitor a variable star for a campaign uh, or an alert, or just because something needs some additional observations. Alexa, hang up the phone. My phone was ringing in the background. You might be a student who's uh, running a little extra course uh, as part of his education and would like to uh, collect some data to help him prepare his final thesis. Or you might be an experienced observer who would like to conduct some specific research on their own uh, to learn a little about another variable star. You can see my proposal here, I hope, I assume. And uh, what I'd like to do is to tell you a little about what, why, and how you might collect your images on the AVS on it. And uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, we have a number of telescopes that are part of the network. The majority of them are uh, bright, what we call bright star monitors. Uh, historically, that name was applied because we have many uh, small refractors, perhaps 70 millimeter in size. And they really were geared towards collecting brighter stars, let's say greater than 12th magnitude, brighter than 12th magnitude. More recently, uh, we've received a long-term lease from Zekmon, thank you folks, uh, of a number of Takahashi E180s, uh, F2.8 telescopes. And uh, we've purchased recently uh, some ASI uh, 183 CMOS cameras. So those of you who are interested in CMOS imaging understand that they run very well and we use them regularly. Zekmon was also uh, able to uh, loan us again some Paramount ND MEs. So rather uh, than using some relatively unsophisticated uh, tripod mounts, uh, we've been able to switch to uh, paramounts on piers. Again, our thanks to Bob Denny of DC3 Dreams for allowing all of the systems to use his ACP scheduler, which makes uh, the very efficient observation of multiple objects during an evening possible. We'd also like to thank uh, our volunteers, those members who have agreed to host one of these telescopes in their backyards. They are really the people who keep things going. We also have uh, another group of telescopes that we now call faint star monitors for a similar reason. Uh, they are larger telescopes, typically on the order of 0.5 or 0.6 meters, uh, cast grains. Uh, and they typically have older CCD cameras, but they work fine. And even now we are switching to some of the more sophisticated 16 bit, bit full image, full scan, uh, cameras that are available. Again, we use ACP scheduler. And in these cases, these telescopes are hosted by private organizations, typically universities. So that's what we have for you, you to use. Now, as I mentioned at the very beginning, what are some of the people uh, who might want to use our system and why? Clearly, people who are in school, and we have a number of those who are interested in uh, proposing and using our telescopes, uh, they're using it for education. Uh, it may be part of their coursework. There are many of you, I'm sure, who also are relatively new to photometry and who'd like to make use of a telescope to collect some images and do their own photometry and learn how to do it well. There are a number of campaigns and alerts that you see regularly on the AVS on a net website. 
And those are things that you might decide that you'd like to help monitor on a regular basis. Now, clearly campaigns and alerts are open to everybody in the organization and they will use their own telescopes uh, to take those images. But sometimes, again, a person who may not have a telescope or the campaign might apply to a southern ab 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 uh, hemisphere object and he's in the northern hemisphere, then they'd like to ask to use uh, the AVSO net telescopes so that they can monitor and provide data to the AID. There are some individuals who are conducting uh, independent research, and you'll see one of those. Uh, Philippe Romanov in uh, Russia uh, is very active in conducting research on variable stars that he look, finds. And he's got a couple of proposals in AVSONet that allow him to follow those stars on a regular basis. There may be uh, underobserved targets. You often see on the website uh, mentions of targets that aren't looked at very often and therefore have scattered points in the light curve generator. This is a way for you to help uh, improve that situation. Again, there may be uh, more experienced people who would like to conduct period analysis on perhaps RLI ray stars or eclipsing binary stars. And this is another way for you to conduct that research and help the AAVSO in that sense. So what and how can you actually create a proposal for yourself? Uh, obviously, you'd need to identify your target. Uh, it can be Northern Southern Hemisphere, as I've mentioned. Uh, it can be uh, a star like a long period variable, uh, which wouldn't need to be uh, sampled, observed that often. Or it could be a cataclysmic variable uh, in which you'd like to sample uh, perhaps in a time series fashion. Uh, one of the things that we'll talk about a little later is time series and the issues of that sucks up a lot of time and doesn't allow other proposals to take place. But that's something we're dealing with and trying to figure out as we proceed with the system. Obviously, we need to know the RA and deck of the, the uh, target. Uh, in fact, we have a way of determining that just from the name, as you can imagine, just as you will but it's always handy to provide that information. So I personally don't have to go looking for it every time. Again, to reiterate, we have two sizes of telescopes, the bright star monitors. Typically they're useful uh, in the target range from 12, uh, from two to 15th magnitude. Yes, we can go as bright as two by using the new CMOS cameras that allow a very rapid cadence, short exposure to be used. And then the faint star monitors of the larger telescopes and they can cover a wide range from 16th to 19th to 20th magnitude. So we can cover pretty much all of the sky that you can uh, desire to uh, observe in terms of magnitude range. We have a full series of uh, Johnson Cousins filters and in, in fact, some Sloan filters. And we also have a grading uh, system uh, that allow you to fix uh, a very uh, low resolution spectrum. Again, observing frequencies, frequency is something uh, that you need to tell us what you want to do for your specific study. Uh, we can take grab samples for you, of course, uh, take one or two samples in each of one, two, three, or four filters, for example, to, so that you can get some astrophysical information from your analysis. We can also do time series. Uh, just a qualifier there, if we had everyone who requested uh, a proposal ask for a time series, you can imagine that we'd be very limited in how many actual observations of multiple targets we could run in an evening. So we're careful about the number of time series that we actually allow to take place. We'd also like a rationale uh, for why you want to observe. Now, historically, that was a request for a relatively sophisticated proposal. That's really no longer the case. It could be as simple as I want to learn how to do photometry. So please take an image for me of this target. Uh, or it could be much more sophisticated where perhaps you'd like to do a time series of an exoplanet uh, and do your own AIG processing of those images. We'd also like to understand uh, that you're going to do something with your data. It could again be as simple as I just want to submit my results to the AID and that's fine. However, as you can imagine, if you would be willing to research uh, your target, write up a little paper, submit it to the AAVSO journal, 
that would clearly be uh, a very interesting and appropriate project proposal for AVS ONET. As I mentioned, AID could be used for your own project at, at school, could be part of a presentation, come to one of our AVSO meetings. Uh, we're more than happy to have new members come and give a presentation. You shouldn't be hesitant about that. You shouldn't be scared about that. It's a good way to learn how to speak in front of the public. And it gives our members an idea of what other members are really doing uh, in terms of photometry. Of course, we'd all like you to write a journal article either for the JAVSO or even some other more sophisticated uh, uh, international publication. So how do you submit a proposal? Uh, under the title, you can see the link for the proposal webpage. Uh, you do a search on proposal AVSO net on the webpage and you'll find this page. It's a very simple form as you can see. Uh, there's a text box. This is really where we'd like to provide you to provide the information that tells us what you'd like to observe, how often you'd like to observe it, what exposure you think you need, what filters you'd like to use, and again, why you'd like to do this. You know, frankly, I've mentioned a lot of reasons for using AVS on it. Uh, I'll give a negative response here that I apologize for up front, but I think it's sort of obvious that AVS ONET is not eye telescope. We don't have a paid staff. We don't have super expensive equipment since most of it's leased or donated to us. Uh, so we're not in a position to compete in any fashion with eye telescope. However, we do have the capability to, with sophist relatively sophisticated equipment uh, to help you conduct your own research. So in the proposal form, we'd like a text box that gives us a rationale for why you'd like us to take some images for you. The obvious things again, our target name is a box for that, RA and declination. We'd like you to go to the trouble of telling us what the magnitude range of your target is. Now, yes, George and I can figure that out on our own, but the whole intent is since we're volunteers uh, that we don't want to be working hours and hours figuring out what needs to be done, uh, that you give us a, a range uh, that tells us you don't, you don't really need to know what exposure specifically is needed on a specific telescope. George and I have done enough of these that we have, in fact, tables that tell us, uh, for example, uh, a 12th magnitude star might need about a 60, minute, a 60 second exposure on the Takahashi epsilons. We'd like to know if you'd like to keep this proprietary or not. Our clear desire is that it not be proprietary. In other words, you'll release the data to the AID as soon as possible. However, if you had a research project that you were interested in uh, preparing a publication for in a journal, and uh, you didn't want to release that those images that are collected to everybody at the AVSO to use, then we will consider that. Obviously, we need to take into account that we're providing this service for everybody, not just a few people who want to do special things for themselves. So that's the proposal form and a just a summary of what type of information we'd like you to provide. Those are the proposal details again that I just mentioned. And you can see the name, the RA and DEC, they happen to be in uh, decimal degrees, um, asking George to help get that into sex adjustment because it's easy for me to create the plan. And the other information on magnitude range, for example, and a choice of telescope. Again, we can make the choice for you, but if you know that it's a Southern Hemisphere object, BSM Berry and BSM South in Australia are clearly the two telescopes that would be selected, not BSM New Hampshire, for example. Pretty obvious stuff, in fact. We'd like you to provide an expiration date uh, rather than allow ACP scheduler to keep your proposal running forever, especially if you're not going to look at the data anymore. We'd like you to provide some idea as to when you think it would be appropriate to stop your uh, proposal. I'll give you an example of uh, some of these proposal details that I mentioned that go into this text box on the proposal page. Uh, Pete Biello, who happens to be uh, uh, one of our members from New Hampshire, uh, has proposed on, I think, three or four proposals now uh, to conduct uh, some research on certain topics. In many cases, uh, they result from a Q 
campaign or an alert on the AVSO page. Uh, and he submits some basic information, his name, of course, uh, his uh, observer code. Uh, that helps AVSONet get the images to you and to your VFOD account uh, in, an, in an easy fashion, in an efficient fashion. Uh, a summary of what the observation is for, in this case, to monitor outbursts, outbursts of a local black hole. Uh, he's going to submit the data to the AID for VFOD analysis because he took my course and he's interested in using VFOD. And again, the specific things, the, the characteristics of the star in terms of name, magnitude, etc. And again, what filters he'd like to use. Uh, it's usually best, in fact, to use at least a couple of filters because you get additional astrophysical information rather than just using one filter. We'll normally do that for you, but it's nice for you to have a rationale for why you'd like to take certain filters. This is a page from the overall uh, proposal list that, that individuals don't see, but George and I see. Uh, you can see as of the end of May, a couple months ago now, uh, there were 212, I think we're 221 at the moment today. Uh, they're from a number of people uh, and they have uh, different uh, rationales behind why they were requested. And you may see some names here. You'll see, yes, you do see the, oh, the terrible word rejected occasionally. In fact, it's interesting because in both of this case, 209 and 207, these were rejected not because we didn't think they were good proposals, but because, uh, in fact, the one that Andrew asked for, 209, somebody else had already asked to support that alert. And we didn't want to have two people taking the same images. So we just said, if you really want to help Andrew, uh, offer to help him with some of the analysis. F Fred Walter, you'll see he has 207 and 208. He happens to be a professional uh, uh, astronomer. Uh, his second one was rejected only because uh, he updated uh, some of the uh, stars that were being used and we didn't need to do a duplicate. So 208 is actually a superset of 207. Now I'd like to go through a few examples with you uh, of, again, why you might want to request uh, some imaging. In other words, what are you proposing? 212 was asked for by John Martin at uh, University of Illinois Springfield. He was interested in Eta Carina uh, because it's, as, as most of you know, a very large, massive, luminous star in the southern hemisphere. And in some cases, actually, it hasn't been followed that carefully in a number of images, uh, filters, excuse me. And he'd like to follow those very carefully in B and V to increase that coverage. And we said, sure, that sounds like a, a reasonable uh, rationale for some, some, a usage of some time on the AVS and telescope system. Stuart Bean uh, from the UK. Uh, wanted to follow a and participate in a BA, uh, British Astronomical Association campaign uh, on CG Dracronus. And it was a, a multi-person campaign, as you can imagine, uh, that required some additional uh, observation from various longitudes uh, throughout the world uh, to increase the coverage. And in fact, in this case, Jeremy Shears was the person who was going to put that campaign together. Pete Biallo, I mentioned he's got a couple of proposals in the works. And uh, as part of a monitoring, uh, as part of a, a, an alert, I believe, uh, he requested that we follow uh, V0616MON uh, in the Southern Hemisphere again uh, to uh, allow him to collect the data, analyze the images himself in VFOT, and submit the data to the AVSO and have the data end up in the light curve generator. Fred Walter, I mentioned, uh, he's a professional again, who's uh, doing a, a project with HH, HST, Hubble Space Telescope, now that it's back to working, yay. Uh, and he's now uh, following some stars in low mass pre-main sequence stars in the Southern Hemisphere. And we're using uh, BSM Berry mainly, and also OC61, which is a university telescope, 0.6 meters uh, in New Zealand, to follow these T-Tori stars. 
and we've actually collected quite a bit of data and it's been very useful to uh, Walter as part of his project. Now, as I mentioned, student education is another uh, key element of the rationale for using uh, AVS ONET. Uh, Dana uh, was conducting a senior capstone project on a number of targets uh, and he, he didn't have uh, the appropriate resources uh, for a variety of poor weather conditions. And he asked if we could assist and provide him some time on the AVSO net uh, so that he could collect additional data so he could get a good grade on his capstone project. Cameron McEwing is uh, uh, from New Zealand. And again, as a part of a project with Variable Stars South, uh, he you know, wanted to work on another project and also an alert notice on an assassin object, a long period eclipsing binary, uh, where he could uh, not do that himself because in fact, Cameron doesn't have his own telescope in his backyard. He often uses SLU in fact, to collect images. So he wanted to get good photometry. So he asked if we could run uh, a long campaign uh, on this project. And we said, yes. Andrew Pierce was interested in following uh, a star so he could actually analyze the variability type. Uh, in fact, if he looked in VSX for NSV3379, and as he mentions here, there's no variability type, no period, uh, no report of amplitude uh, of 0.6 magnitudes. So again, he made a request that we do a certain amount of imaging in BVRI and we agreed and it's been going on for some period of time now. Another alert notice uh, by Dennis Means, one of our members in the Southwest uh, to follow some stars in Ophiuchus and Lyra. Uh, again, as a result of a request for alert notice by Steve Howell, uh, to do long-term coverage of these stars. And he's been running these now, uh, even though the date shows 2021, uh, he's been doing those himself on other telescopes uh, for an even longer period. So he's the one main resource at the AVSO in terms of submitting such results right now. So another reason that we said yes. And in fact, as you can see, uh, there's been a long history of visual data in the light curve generator. And you see all these uh, orange crosses on the right-hand side of the light curve. Uh, those are all images that have been collected by uh, AVS ONET telescopes uh, and that uh, Dennis has analyzed uh, over the last few months. And you can see, uh, nice to see, in fact, that the uh, different filters, probably B, V, uh, B, V, and I probably in that order from top to bottom. Uh, are in fact giving good results and similar to in fact the visual results that were also observed in the past. Philip, I mentioned Romanoff uh, is uh, very into discovering stars uh, on his own using data mining. And he wanted to confirm uh, the period of this eclipsing binary, uh, his Romanoff V20 that he has found. And in fact, we agreed that that would be a good thing to do. In fact, in this case, this was a time series uh, proposal. Uh, so again, we're very careful about that, to be honest with you, since we don't want that to overwhelm all of the other proposals that are on a, of a grab nature. Uh, but occasionally we'll use specific telescopes uh, and carefully manage the time involved and get him some uh, long-term time series data on any given evening. And in this case, he specifically had a few specific dates and times when he knew a minimum would occur. So he was able to tell us specifically a start time and an end time on a specific date, which made it very easy for me to set up a proposal, uh, excuse me, a plan uh, in scheduler uh, to run those on uh, a couple of scopes. And sure enough, really nice results that he got uh, that you see here. In fact, he was able to get two primary eclipses on the left and to the right, but you'll also notice that he was able to get uh, some secondary eclipses. These are not all, all the eclipses are not shown here, just so you don't get faked out by that. Uh, but he's seeing a couple of, and it was very nice to see that we were able to see the differences in amplitude 
for each of the different filters. Uh, the B filter being a little bit different than the red filter, for example. So some personal research, uh, which he's going to publish in one of the journals, hopefully. Uh, more recently, uh, Jeremy Shears has asked, uh, developed, set up a campaign at the BAA uh, to uh, follow the outbursts of IX draconis. And uh, we're usually receptive to that, and it's another type of uh, project that we would be willing to support. And in fact, you can see a couple of outbursts here, right there on my cursor is, I hope you can see that. And again, and a nice regular interval, as you can see. Uh, so th those outbursts are, or super outbursts, are, uh, have a good period uh, that's quite repeatable. Uh, very recently, uh, uh, school in a, a group in France, uh, specifically some students uh, in a school uh, led by Anna Kalekic, uh, their teacher, uh, got involved in the campaign following WASP 148B, so an exoplanet. And uh, we were able to provide them some time. In fact, I made sure that the students were the ones who defined when a transit would happen on a specific telescope in our system, for example, New Mexico or New Hampshire. And they put the effort into finding that out when that transit would occur, when it was best, what day it was best to observe that completely, total, total transit in any one of our telescopes. And we were able to follow that. And in fact, then the student, uh, not George and I, but the student, then uh, in this case, not, but uh, uh, in, a, in a less attractive uh, image, uh, they were able to uh, find, in fact, a relatively small, in this case, 5.7 parts per thousand was the size of this transit. Uh, that's about as best as you can do with ground braced uh, telescopes, especially anything as modest as the, the eight or nine inch, uh, uh, seven or eight inch telescopes that we have in the system. So really a lot of good work uh, uh, comes out of uh, each of our telescopes. So I'm gonna stop there. Uh, I think I've taken more time than I thought I was. Uh, and in fact, uh, we're not actually going to respond to questions right now we're going to give Gary a chance to give his presentation, uh, and then we'll get back to questions that uh, Lauren will read to us at the end of the time. So I will unshare my screen and give it back to Lauren. Thank you very much, Mr. Medidis. That was great. All right. So um, next up on our list, we're going to be hearing from someone who is exceptionally good when it comes to gear. Um, he earned his master's degree in mechanical and aeronautical engineering at MIT and currently works at the Maria Mitchell Observatory as the telescope engineer and astronomer. He has been at the forefront of astronomical imaging tech since 1959 when he shot his first astrophoto on Tri-X film. Fast forward a few years and he was the first amateur to submit a CCD observation to the AADSO's database. And when CMOS sensors came along, he was the first there too. As of today, he has over 129,000 photometric observations in the database, and I expect that before too long, he'll have some spectra to submit too. He's been working on a really exciting project to bring some more spectrographic capabilities to the AVSO remote telescope network. And today, we are lucky enough to have him here to give all of us a sneak peek. So uh, without any further ado, please allow me to introduce Mr. Gary Walker. Mr. Walker. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, okay, I see your screen share. All right. Hello. Good morning, afternoon, and evening. Uh, thank you for attending our section webinar. I uh, had been working on uh, BSM Hamron, uh, which is one of the other telescopes, um, and uh, it became operational and uh, um, started thinking about what to do for uh, next project. And uh, so out of that uh, was born the idea uh, that I'll be discussing 
today. So what is BSM Hamron? Uh, a picture of it is on the left. It is a, a small observatory. It's now residing in Hawaii um, and it's nearly operational. It has been operational and uh, collected some data. And uh, it's, uh, as Ken mentioned, it's an Epsilon 180, a Paramount mount, uh, ACP computer, et cetera. And uh, the enclosure here is one which uh, it designed up, which would uh, allow us to protect it from the weather. Um, we call it a roll-up observatory. And uh, it has basically that roll-off roof, which pivots and allows you to observe most of the sky, most of the observable sky. On the right is a picture of it all packaged up on a, on a pallet and about to be craned off of the deck of my house and uh, headed for Hawaii. So that left an empty spot on my deck. And I thought about doing something uh, in the spectra area. And um, I have taken almost zero spectra in the past and I, like almost all, all the people probably who are attending, uh, I've had an SA200 and done you know a little bit of that, but never any serious spectrum. So uh, uh, I saw a growing interest in spectroscopy and uh, created a project to try and develop a remote capability for this, which has um, been attempted in the amateur world, but not really su uh, successfully completed to this point. And uh, it is done in a professional observatory. So we know that uh, with infinite money and time of grad students, it's certainly possible. So I call this the Bright Spectral Robot, BSR for short. And uh, the reason for this is obvious if it's gonna be robotic in a dark sky, uh, we call it a robot and bright because uh, spectra because you were spreading the light over the entire chip for a star uh, with wavelength, uh, the exposures tend to be quite long and, or the telescopes need to be quite large. So the apertures. So uh, we wanted to be capable of, of doing spectra remotely from a dark site where the weather is good. Uh, it, as I said, has been done by professionals. Uh, and the question is, could it be done on a similar scale to AAVSO net bright star monitors, which you heard Ken talk about earlier? And the answer is it's believed to be yes. And so many have tried and, and abandoned uh, spectra remotely. Most of the people who do spectra are sitting by their telescope and adjusting things. And um, so, we did some uh, thinking and talking to people and uh, tried to determine you know, what the limitations were. So the approach that we took was to limit this to bright stars, um, six to 10th magnitude um, because of the apertures available and um, also because of the uh, pointing uh, requirements of, uh, to do spectra. Typically you try and put the star of the interest right on the slit of the spectrograph. And that's an extremely challenging uh, thing to do. And by restricting it to not just any star in the field, but to only the brightest star in the field, we think that is gonna help, uh, help, us, allow, help allow us to do that. Um, tried to limit it to software that was available off the shelf uh, didn't really feel that uh, having, uh, you know, a, a um, somebody write a custom software or spend hours writing it myself uh, was going to really advance things very well. We wanted it to be something that, that anybody could, could purchase and use. Same with the hardware. Uh, we tried to have almost no custom parts, uh, use everything that was typically available that would do the job. Um, the key is to focus on the autonomous pointing aspect of this. Uh, basically in the robot that I have, the slit is about 2.8 arc seconds. So that means you need to point the telescope to about one arc second in order to be successful. 
And um, that's an extremely challenging thing to do. And then uh, we did not want this to impact the, uh, the Bright Star Monitor program at all. So uh, we set it up so that there would be no, no impact to uh, AAVSO net other than uh, the uh, people working on it and spending their time. As I mentioned, uh, the pointing aspect is really important. Uh, we focused in the design on making things extremely rigid. Um, and every piece of equipment was selected primarily for spectroscopy and uh, optimized for spectroscopy. Um, I mentioned pointing accuracy to arc seconds and pointing on the slit. We're going to restrict it to bright stars. Uh, we're going to develop it for an eye for automation so that uh, while the unit sits on my back deck where Hammerin was, uh, which is extremely convenient for getting things commissioned and debugged, the plan will be to put it in a remote dark site uh, at uh, some point in the future. So how did we implement this? Um, first of all, we chose a plane wave L3 L350 mount, primarily because of its very high resolution encoders. Typically it's 0.05 arc seconds per tick. I also had experience with, the, uh, with an L500 mount and I knew that the pointing uh, without trying very hard uh, was in a neighborhood of seven or eight arc seconds on, on the uh, scope that I have operating. And that is without doing a plate solve and without doing a second move or anything. It's just plain the raw uh, pointing air of, of the uh, technology. Um, the tube assembly selected was the CDK-14. A um, couple of features which directed that, that choice was, first of all, there's no mirror flop. Uh, if you can point the telescope with your mount extremely precisely, but you have any mirror flop or flexure in, in the optics, then that will dominate. Uh, it also has a carbon fiber tube truss assembly which means that the, the problems of focusing and refocusing are minimized. I'll show you that I used a, an on-axis diagonal guider, um, and I used a large one for rigidity, um, and uh, it sort of enabled this all this equipment to fit on the back of the CDK-14 and also uh, mount it extremely rigidly. rigidly. It also has a a second camera pass through, which normally is used for guiding. Uh, but I don't do that. I use a, a, uh, a guiding module on the spectrograph and pick off the star that way. The spectrograph chosen was a UVEX unit. It's a brand new unit that Shellyak is uh, uh, manufacturing and selling. It's a, a, an industrialized version of the uh, DIY spectrograph that many uh, folks in the spectrographic world have been working on. It has an R resolution of about 1500 maximum. Uh, while it isn't totally robotic at the moment, the plans are for uh, added modules that will allow uh, rotation of the grading and so forth uh, to make it totally robotic. Um, I'm going to be using a ZW0294 CMOS camera right now. And I've also piggybacked a Takahashi Epsilon 130 with a, an SBIG STC 428P. So we can do simultaneous photometry and also spectroscopy. Also designed a four by four by five and a half foot roll up enclosure. It was like Hamron, but basically about 10% bigger, holds all the equipment in an alt azimuth mode, uh, can automate with maximum DL, ACP, and scheduler. Uh, I mentioned that no dollar impact to AEVSO net, uh, but we'll be collaborating uh, and leveraging the AAVSO net infrastructure and pipeline and uh, the spectral database so that uh, data can go uh, 
directly in a correct format to, to that, just like BSM. And then when it's operational, we'll move it to a dark site. This is a picture uh, of the tube assembly, the CDK-14 on the left and the Epsilon-130 on the right. The Epsilon-130 was a scope which I had, was my first serious scope about 25 years ago. And uh, I have just never sold it. And uh, it's just ideal for, for doing uh, photometry. It's the little brother of the Epsilon-180s. This is a picture of the enclosure and being built in my garage. Um, the dimension of, as I said, it's about four feet square on the base and about five and a half feet tall. And it mounts on a piece of plywood. This is a marine grade plywood. And the pier itself for the L350 mount is shown here a three quarter inch piece of aluminum. It's uh, just bolted to the deck. Uh, I don't have a concrete pier on this. Uh, I went through uh, the uh, town attempting to get a permit to uh, extend this deck and put a, a put a concrete pier in and it just got so bogged down in the permitting process that I finally just decided to try this and and see if it would uh, would work the decks extremely strong, but it is still a deck. It's got two by 12s and, uh, and large, you know, six by six timbers holding it up and so forth. So, and there's a picture of the, the base and the construction of the, the roll up. The, uh, turns out that it's a very simple structure, but um, it's very sensitive to small misalignments and angles and things. So you have to make sure that things are perpendicular and parallel. And, and uh, so that's, here's a picture of a jig that I made in order to do that. And then this is with the picture on the right shows the second side of the roll up. And actually Hamron was still with me at this point because it's shown over here in the right. And, uh, this is a picture uh, when completed and moved to a different location on the deck to uh, um, allow a uh, view from uh, our master bedroom. My wife didn't like the first location that I selected. So um, I show it here. It's operated via a couple of uh, uh, linear actuators uh, on the arms here. And there's a picture with the L350 mounted inside and under construction. The, the, uh, the front here, the roof obviously opens. This piece here is, is hinged now so that it can be open for quick access. This piece can be taken off uh, for major things. And in the picture that I just showed you, both of those pieces are off and, and the rest of the structure is, is in place. And then with the CDK-14 mounted in there, and uh, the clearance uh, is a little bit tight. Uh, and I had to do some adjusting of the location of the enclosure so that every half inch and every quarter inch was uh, used uh, to, uh, to clear the tube. And the tube will go down to 30 degrees above the horizon, uh, but, uh, but uh, in some orientations, uh, uh, that's the lowest that it will go. Uh, other orientations, uh, it can go lower. But uh, my feeling is that for most things that you're going to look at, the uh, you're going to not want to have an air mass of greater than two anyway. Um, and uh, the increased size of the enclosure would uh, also um, be uh, possible uh, on future uh, generations if, if you really wanted to operate right down to the horizon. And there's a picture on the left with a CDK-14 and the Epsilon-130. 
On the right is the, is the business end of this, and it shows the focuser here. It's an Atlas FLI focuser. Here's the ONAG, which provides a diagonal. This is the calibration module, and this is the, um, the guiding module from the uh, ALPI that Shelly Xpen sells. And then this device on top here is the, the, uh, the UVEX uh, spectrograph. And one of the reasons that I put the diagonal in is that all of this equipment would have to extend out the back. And number one, it wouldn't clear the mount. And number two, if you can imagine a stack of another 15 inches of equipment here and then try to hold that to an arc second, you can see that that was probably not going to be successful. Um, this is what that stack looks like in cross section. The CDK 14 is here on the left. The uh, Atlas is here in blue. And I've been shown here something which I call an H pattern bracket. And um, I have to move my screen a bit here. And then this is the ONAG diagonal. And then there's an adapter. There's a filter wheel here, which I'll talk about. There's the ALPI calibration module and the ALPI guiding module. And then the spectrograph on top could either be a UVEX or an ALPI. And then there's something in, in yellow and green I call a strut that connects these two pieces here, it connects a spectrograph and the H bracket. And that strut is intended to give additional stiffness to this stack of instrumentation, both in this direction and then in and out of the paper. And the way this works is everything shown in blue here is basically all aluminum and uh, should all expand and contract approximately the same with temperature. The uh, atlas is uh, the red part, red thing that you see here is the part that actually moves and everything in blue here all moves in unison back and forth uh, in order to, uh, to make the focus. And uh, the reason they do this is to get additional uh, stiffness here. The H bracket is made of channeled aluminum, which I can show you in this graph, this uh, chart. You can see the channels here, they're attached to the atlas. And then this, the strut attaches here. This is all extremely rigid and uh, gives an additional rigidity to the uh, spectrograph. And this is what it looks like when it's set up with a computer outside and so the progress so far, I've downloaded the software for PWI for the mount, connected it to the mount. I've balanced, tuned, and homed the mount, set the park position. I've done parks, I've done go-tos, downloaded the ASCOM platform, uh, Windows 10 camera driver, the ASCOM driver for the 294, the Atlas Focuser driver. And I took the first solar spectrum, which I'll show you in a minute using this setup with the UVEX and the CDK14, all, all in Maxim. Um, I took 20 solar spectra and I uh, stacked them and cropped them, created a line plot, which I'll show you. And uh, I took some, some, uh, some darks uh, for the ZW0294 camera some 300 second darks to see what the darks, see what the amp glow in that camera looked like uh, in this setup. Also downloaded Demetra, which is the software I'll be using uh, for the Spectra. Um, it's a all-in-one. I'll talk a little bit more about that, why it was selected. Um, I connected uh, the camera to Demetra uh, and um, I took a solar image that way also. Um, like, this was all over a period of several days. And uh, when I actually took the spectra, I finally, got, it got cloudy and cold. And, and uh, so I quit while I was ahead that night. 
This is a picture of the, uh, of the dark frame for the CW0294 camera. Uh, you can see the amp glow up here in the upper left. Uh, it, it seems to be significantly lower than in uh, Christian Buell's review on the web for this camera. Um, it also allows you to get, uh, uh, use the 600 uh, line per millimeter grading and get all of the blue part of the spectrum down to about 3,500 angstroms and then it allows you to go up to about 7,000. So you get the H alpha too. So the advantage being that you, you get pretty much everything in one shot instead of having to do this in two shots if you use a, a smaller, smaller camera. Or the other thing you could do is you could go to a 300 line per, per uh, millimeter uh, grading but uh, I wanted to get the resolution and get, get the range, the wavelength range. This is the, the stack, this is a solar spectrum. Um, and uh, it was the, the first one that I captured. And one of the reasons I, uh, this is just of the sky, it's not really the sun. And the reason is that you can almost always in the daytime get the sky and uh, at night, sometimes you can't get stars, so. In fact, lately it's been most of the time. And then this is a line plot of what that spectrum looked like. And uh, that was a, a stack of, of 20, 20 frames. And I think, uh, I don't remember the exposure exactly, but the daytime sky, it's gonna be a matter of a couple of seconds for uh, an exposure. I mentioned Dimitra software. Uh, after uh, doing a little bit of looking at other softwares, uh, selected it. Uh, there are a lot of great videos online that Shogak has provided on how to use the software. Uh, it's very well organized. It's very logical. And the software is very straightforward. It's an all-in-one solution. So you can literally take and control uh, images that you, you um, want to do and keep track of uh, your calibration, your flats, your darks, your biases, and your science frames. And then most important, it has a, a process already defined. You just tell it where all of those files are and then uh, you push the button and magically it calibrates everything. Uh, and, and it writes a, an output file that's compatible with the AAVSO spectroscopic database. And uh, it happens to be open source and free and uh, very, very responsive uh, owner of Sheliak, uh, getting back to you when you have questions and so forth. Also developed a automation module. And you, you wanna take all these images, these flats, dark science biases, uh, and you wanna do it with ACP under control uh, robotically. So there is a, a, a thing called a Spox that um, is available for this setup and allows you to, with, a, with its own app, to, to uh, light the calibration lamps and, and so forth. But uh, I didn't see how it would integrate with ACP and Maxim very well. You could do it if you wanted to write a bunch of code and uh, I didn't particularly want to do that. So devised a way to do this with, with, with no code. And so inside the filter wheel in the image stack, I located a, a magnet here, it's a small neodymium iron magnet. And this filter wheel, you need a filter wheel anyway, because being a CMOS camera, you need a, you need a dark frame. So you need a filter that's completely blocked. And then when this filter wheel rotates, it, you can then uh, get either a calibration lamp or a, or a flat field lamp to light. And the way that's done is, is I have this little module of these, these relays with these magnetic switches. You see the magnetic switch there and there. And that sits on top of the filter wheel here. And so when the magnet gets under this, magnetic switch, it closes the relay. And then that relay is one of two relays that, 
that will either turn on the calibration lamp or it'll turn on the, the uh, flat field lamp. And there's the other side of it. And you can see the calibration, the flat field, the magnetic, sen magnetic sensors are now uh, underneath the circuit board here. And here it is mounted on the filter wheel along with the, <clears throat> the connections and so forth. So I can go into Maxim and I can set up a sequence and I say, you know, go to the dark filter, go to the, go to the uh, calibration position and then filter wheel will rotate and it'll turn on the calibration lamp. And I'll say, okay, go ahead and turn on the, the flat field lamp. So I, I just add another image of with the flat filter, the so-called flat filter, and it uh, does the same. And then uh, you can also get get a bias frame. So you can literally in a matter of about a minute automatically and remotely, you know, get all the calibration information that you need to do uh, to do the science. And that's what that stack up looks like with all the wires connected with the flat and the calibration um, shown here in the calibration module. In this picture, you can see the guide camera is here. The science camera is here on the left. So initially had some, some difficulties with the new plate solving software in the, in the L350 mount. Turns out you have to load uh, a data, star database, database <clears throat> and it's in two parts. And uh, the trick is you got to load it part two, and then you load part one, but they didn't tell you that in the instructions. So, <laughs> excuse me, it didn't work on, uh, on at first pass, but with the help of, uh, of uh, Bill Dean at Plainway, we figured out <clears throat> what the problem had to be that, and it was another Windows 10 thing that uh, kind of bit us. Um, the pointing model uh, has a very nice, routine to do the pointing model. And uh, I was getting about eight arc seconds RMS to start with. And the encouraging news is that I was getting one to two arc seconds in altitude, which uh, probably is the harder axis to, to get that kind of pointing. Um, but I was getting about 20 arc seconds RMS in azimuth. So there's some kind of a, a uh, an issue there to, that I have to resolve because I know that it, the mount is capable of significantly better than that. And I've uh, submitted a ticket with Plane Wave, and they came back and suggested some alternate points to use to, uh, to do the pointing model. And uh, I've had about four weeks of cloudy weather since, uh, since then. And then on top of that, uh, the, uh, the brand new computer that was in, had all the software loaded, uh, died. So took few days to get a new one and I had to reload all the software. And so now I'm, uh, I'm all set to go. And uh, I attempted to actually, um, before the computer died, I attempted to calibrate a, a spectra of, uh, of the moon, uh, mainly because I could point to the moon quite easily. And I found another issue and that is that the Demetra software uh, scales the darks. Um, and uh, uh, shouldn't actually, in my experience, I've tested about five cameras for, for a dark current. And uh, if you're gonna use them over a broad range, like from seconds to, to, to tens of seconds to hundreds of seconds, I find that the, that the dark current isn't linear. Um, I don't know why. Um, but I've yet to find a camera that I would say is is linear in dark current with time. So on all my photometry, I basically take darks the same as a science image and uh, solve the problem that way. I try to do some modeling of this effect and and it's a very strange effect. and uh, um, I don't don't understand uh, why uh, it seems to do that, but uh, Anyway, the workaround is you just take the darks the same as your science and, and, and you're done. You don't have to do any scaling, so.
This is a plot of the uh, error versus azimuth of the mount. The two dotted lines are the, uh, the uh, slit spectra, which is about 2.8 arc seconds. And uh, as you can see in the y-axis here, uh, most all the points are within 2.8 arc seconds. Now, I think that the remaining points by doing a, a plate solve and then doing a second just small correction to the slews, I'll be able to uh, to be within the slit uh, uh, each time, which for robotic operation, you definitely need to be. If the star is not, you know, in the middle of the slit here, then, you know, you're losing light. So if the star is, is for instance, right on this line, then you're really only going to get half of the light and you're already starved for photons. So you want to make sure that you can can uh, locate within uh, the confines of the slit. And this is a plot of the problem in the other axes, uh, which RMS is out to about 20 arc seconds, but it peaks up at, at 80 arc seconds. And uh, from my other mount, I know that this, there's just something isn't being done right either in software or, or something. I don't suspect it's a mechanical problem. Um, and then this is in the azimuth axis. The azimuth axis, I mean, how can you have errors in the azimuth axis? If you have errors, they should be in the elevation axis. So this should be the easy axis, but um, I'm sure we'll get to the bottom of that. And this is a plot of both X and y altitude and, and azimuth axis errors. And you can see that, you know, altitude, the errors are all very small. The smallest circle here is a five arc second circle. So, um, pretty much everything's within five arc seconds and I think we'll be able to do a second slew and probably uh, be right right in the center of everything here. Uh, an additional goal of the setup is to do simultaneous photography, photometry and spectroscopy. Uh, I've been working with a group called the Spectroscopy Discussion Group. It's headed up by Woody Sims and uh, he started a project to uh, simultaneously monitor uh, AD Leo for for uh, both photometry and spectroscopy. Um, I had ten good. I didn't have any. I didn't have my spectrograph ready, but I said, "Well, if you want, let's just take photometry and see what happens." And I had ten good nights with the B filter, uh, and which would be uh, where the H gamma and H beta lines are, and uh, those were thought to be the most active and in. in these the in uh, AD Leo, and I got several of these what they're called Freds. They're fast rise exponential decay stars, and um, I'll show you a picture here. The blue curve is uh, AD Leo, and um, the pink curve is the uh, the K minus C value. And uh, on the night of five fourteen, uh, you see the the sharp rise here and then the exponential decay. And um, that didn't occur at the same time that, that uh, Woody got a, a spectrograph on this object, but he and Bob Buckheim on another night did have simultaneous observations with two spectrographs. And I think you might may have seen Bob's talk on that. He talked about that at SAS. So in any project, you have many, many stages and you sort of start out here. Uh, this is a, a graph of normalized knowledge on the y-axis and time on the, on the x-axis. And this is a, a, a chart that was presented in technology review <clears throat> with regard to Omar Bose when he was developing his loudspeakers. Uh, he started working, and, and as you work on a project, you know, you learn knowledge, and you, so your, your, your knowledge here grows, and it sort of there's this euphoric stage, and then you get to a point of inflection here, and you sort of get to the oh shucks moment here, where you realize that the more you work, the more you learn you didn't know, and so you keep working, and eventually you hit rock bottom here. And now you start working, and now you make some progress, and you start learning about the things you didn't know. And then at this point, usually in industry, the management recommends that you you know you you kill a project and and uh, 
and call it a, you know, you've had some marginal success. And so let's quit while we're moving ahead. And so most projects die right about here. Because if you keep working, eventually you get back to the point where you know as much as you thought you knew when you started. And then when you get up here, you make real progress. And so we're probably right here where the, the red ball is. And so we're still, you know, learning things. And um, we probably have another three or four months of, of operation before we get to the point where we would say that we're kind of operational. So I'm going to need to add a weather station to this. I'm going to need to add a uh, max dome type weather uh, uh, dome control so that the, uh, it can open up when the weather's clear. And once it's operational, I'm going to be looking for a couple of beta, beta testers who will be willing to uh, reduce data and, uh, and provide feedback. So if you're interested in being a beta tester, my email list, uh, address is listed below. And uh, you, can, uh, you can shoot me an email if you're interested. So with that, I'll close and questions and answers. OK, thank you very much, Mr. Walker. That was excellent. And I'm uh, really looking forward to being able to use this uh, spectrographic rig you're setting up. Thank now, you. we have had uh, several questions come in from the attendees. So I'm going to go ahead and start. Um, this one, I think, was directed at uh, Mr. Menzies and Mr. Silvis. Uh, Dr. Barbara Harris had asked, can you do your own photometry um, as in on the images that you get from the Bright Star Monitor telescopes without using VFOT. How do you get to your images if you're not using VFOT? Yes, Barbara, this is Ken. Uh, there are two ways that you will get your images. One is in VFOT if you want them, and the other is through an FTP site that we have at the moment, uh, and you can download them yourself and use whatever software you desire. All right, thank you very much. <clears throat> um, Okay, next off, uh, George Michael Puehler, sorry if I mispronounced your name, um, had asked, is it possible to collect photometric data for a project that is based somewhere other than the AAVSO using the AAVSO's remote telescopes? Uh, George says he's thinking of long-term monitoring um, some young stellar objects for a project which is hosted in the University of Kent. And I noticed that question, George. Uh, the, the first answer is simple. Uh, in order to use AAVSO net, you need to be an AAVSO member. So somebody who makes a proposal needs to be a member. The second question is a little more difficult. Uh, as you noticed from some of the campaigns that I mentioned, one was being conducted by uh, a French group. Uh, the other one was from a BAA associate of ours. Uh, so there's lots of flexibility. I would recommend that you uh, provide us a proposal. Uh, and as long as the AVSO uh, gets some recognition, acknowledgement out of the work, uh, ideally you'd provide the information to the AVSO AID uh, so that other members can see it. Uh, but as I mentioned, sometimes we allow proprietary work as well. Uh, so we're flexible. Uh, keep that in mind that we do have some desire to make certain that it's usable for AVSO work. Uh, and uh, I think that will answer most of your questions. Okay, uh, thank you very much. So uh, next up, I've got a few questions for Mr. Walker. Um, so first of all, let's talk about slit orientation because there are a couple of related questions. Uh, so Jay Miller had asked, since your mount is alt azimuth, what do you do about field rotation? Well, the almost all the professional observatories that do spectra have alt azimuth mounts. And so in talking to Arnie, he recommended that we go that way. Um, the, the field rotation will rotate and uh, there's nothing you can do about that. Uh, so, but if, you, if your star is located in the slit, I don't think the star is gonna rotate out of the slit. My expectation, you know, we'll be auto guiding, and as long as the star stays in the slit, we'll be fine. Okay, thank you. Um, so, speaking of slit orientation, um, when I was at 
the Sacramento Mountain Spectroscopy Workshop, uh, one thing that was made, one thing that was mentioned was that um, the slit should always be perpendicular to the horizon so as not to um, have distortions to the continuum due to atmospheric dispersion. Like at lower altitudes, um, you have a slight prismatic effect, uh, slight chromatic aberration. And so they said, always keep your slit vertical. Is that something that you would be doing here? Or is that not even going to be a factor because you're shooting too high in the sky? Or what, what do you know about that? I think it's the opposite. I think, I think you want the slit parallel so that any uh, um, extinction is across the short dimension and not dispersed along the wavelength dimension. Um, and so this slit is located in that orientation. If, okay. if, you, if you use a equatorial mount, then your orientation is going to vary with, you know, depending on where the object is in the sky. Mm -hmm. And now you have a, a, change, a time changing effect and also an effect that will couple into the, the wavelength and create an error uh, in, in, the, uh, in the amplitude with wavelength. So that's the, the reason for the, the preference for alt azimuth mounting of spectra. Okay, uh, thank you. All right, so next there's a couple questions about calibration frames. Um, Tim Stone had asked, does your flat process include the entire optical train or just the spectrometer? It, it, it uh, only includes the spectrometer as far as um, um, the way it's set up now. Um, if we were taking an image, then we would need the optical train to be there also. But since we're only interested in the, the star in the center, I don't think the telescope optical train uh, will affect things. That makes sense. Okay, thank you. Um, and so next question about the calibration frames. Will the images coming out of a uh, out of this observatory be automatically uh, flatted and darked, or will those frames be delivered separately? What To what degree of reduction will the images be provided? Right now, it's certainly when we're doing beta testing, the images will not be calibrated, but the, the calibration images will be provided. Uh, okay. uh, when we build the pipeline, we could possibly make it so that everything is reduced. Uh, but that would require the uh, incorporation of Demetra and controlling Demetra, which is something uh, I'm not sure we want to do. Um, OK, uh, thank you. And then one more question related to that. I'm assuming that when um, someone wants to instrument response correct their spectrum, are they going to need to schedule uh, alongside their observation an A star? Or is that something, or you know, a spectral standard, or is that something that uh, you will take care of? How, how will instrument response uh, correction be done? Yeah, yeah, we we will have to take uh, a nearby star uh, and take a spectra of it to get the instrument response, um, and uh, that will be built into uh, ACP. In other words, uh, you'll tell ACP this is the target. And you'll go observe it, and then you'll go observe your your um, reference star either before or after, or maybe both. And and if it's a real long spectra, then probably even during a few times. Okay. So AP, ACP can be set up so that you you have uh, two two uh, image sets, and the first image set can be. Um, a cal, and then the other image set can be the, the science. All right, that sounds like a good system. Thanks. Um, okay, and uh, the next question comes in from Joseph Kalin, who has asked, can you share the design of the roll-up observatory? 
eventually, yes, uh, we do have CAD plans of Hamron, but I don't have CAD plans yet of, of the spectral robot. Uh, but um, possibly in the future, the, uh, I can convince Al Swiskey to, uh, to document it for me. <laughs> Excellent. Well, it's a very cool observatory. Thank you. Okay. Um, and more questions about spectra. Um, so next, these are some questions about mainly the uh, range of wavelengths. So Tim Stone had asked, um, does the on axis uh, guider diagonal that you're using uh, take near infrared spectroscopy off the table? So are you able to access the near infrared or not? Yeah, you're not able to do near infrared also. Uh, I, I tried to get a custom mirror made that would be totally broadband, uh, uh, but they could not uh, find one at any reasonable cost. And I looked at, at things like Edmonds and Thor Labs and uh, a few other places. And it's sort of like, well, do you want the blue or do you want the red? You can have near infrared, but you can't have blue. So um, right now, most of the work done on small telescopes and spectrographs are, are focusing somewhere from 3,500 to 7,000 as uh, seems to be the active range. And uh, the, the UVEX is capable of, of doing uh, apparently almost down to 3,000, but it gets kind of noisy. Problem is uh, you need a flat lamp that, that will give a good signal to noise on the blue end. And, and it kind of dies at about 3,500, the best lamp that they've been able to find. So if anybody mm -hmm. has a 3,000 to 7,000 cal lamp uh, that's reasonably priced, uh, I'm sure that Sheliak would be interested in that. I'm sure. I imagine it would be hard to work down at uh, 3,000, even with a good lamp, with the amount that the atmosphere is absorbing at those wavelengths. Yep. That that's that's an, another problem, but uh, you know if if this thing ends up going to to uh, Sierra mode or goes to to New Mexico skies or something or in like that, then up at seven thousand feet, that would make it a little bit better anyway. Yeah. So um, other questions about the uh, wavelength domain about how wide is the field of view of the camera and angstroms? Can you capture the whole spectrum at once? You can capture from 3,500 to 7,000 at once with the, the 294 camera. Very uh, nice. Actually, you can, I, you can get from 3,000 to 7,000 uh, with the, the 294 camera. Very nice. And you mentioned um, multiple gradings. So is that going to be something where um, people who submit proposals can choose which grading they want to use? Um, this is where it goes from being uh, robotic to being you need to be at the telescope because while the gradings can be changed, it requires you to be there and, and do that. Mm -hmm. um, There probably is no reason to go lower than 600 from what I've seen. Mm -hmm. uh, granted, if you want to go to 1200 or 2400, you know, you do get better resolution. And uh, uh, if we find that we, we benefit from that, we might consider doing it. But uh, I think we're going to end up for the bright spectral robot, we're going to we're going to have probably one grading, and my guess, from what I know at the moment, is will be the 600 grading. Uh, that gives an R of about 1,500, and there are lots of projects that uh, that can be done at that level. Um, there's, there's, uh, I'm not sure that you can automate a, a shell spectrograph at 15,000 R to uh, to do what we're doing here. Right. Yeah. Um, 1500 is a great res. So um, one more question about the bright spectral robot, and then we're going to go to a more general question. So uh, Ray Tomlin had asked, uh, was there a free mechanical mesh analysis software that you could use for flexure and resonances? Uh, there, there probably is. I did not 
have access to to one, so I did not use it. Uh, and uh, my experience in the past has been you do that, and then you build the hardware, and you test the hardware, and then you go back and you figure out what you had wrong in the analysis to make it agree with what the hardware is doing. And uh, so um, I think it, it probably would be a good thing, but uh, um, without the access to it, uh, um, it's kind of water under the dam. Mm -hmm. Thanks. All right, uh, this next question is addressed to uh, all of you. So, uh, do you make use of the Brightstar monitor network yourself? Is that how you do your photometry? I'll go first, then George can speak. Uh, I have uh, two telescopes in the backyard, uh, so I mainly use those. I have on mm -hmm. one occasion used uh, the AVS and telescopes. Okay. And same here, I, I have my own setup. Um, my interest in the BSM is primarily as a, a technician, a software engineer. And I work with Cliff Kotnick to make the pipeline work, to make sure all the instruments work. Um, it's a beautiful system, but I, I, I don't use it. So it's available to everybody else. I, I have used it in the past. Uh, I don't haven't used it in quite a while, but uh, my experience was good enough that I decided that I wanted my own remote telescope. And so I have that now set up and, and uh, in, in clear skies where the weather is good uh, almost every night. Awesome. All right, well, uh, thank you. Now, I think uh, there's a couple more questions about the uh, spectroscopy rig, the spectral robot. So um, when you mentioned the limiting magnitude, was it, it was about 10, right? Uh, yes. And if so, that's with, that's with what kind of exposure time are we talking about here? Is that 10 minutes, an hour? Yeah, typically most, most of the time you end up taking uh, either 300 or 600 second exposures and then stacking them. Mm -hmm. uh, typically for an hour to two hours when you start pushing 10th, 11th, 12th magnitude, um, so. Okay, all right. That's actually uh, pretty reasonable for a spectrograph of that resolution. So uh, this one is about the bright star uh, monitor photometric telescopes. Um, Ken, you had mentioned that there are uh, gratings in the filter wheel. Uh, could you speak some more about the, those capabilities for spectrum? Sure, there is an SA200 uh, grading in two of the BSM telescopes. Mm -hmm. uh, it frankly isn't used very often. Uh, in, in one case, I can relate an issue we had with it. Uh, the field was so dense with stars mm -hmm. that you get overlap in many of the spectra from the individual stars, and it's a little more difficult to separate those. Uh, you also need a relatively bright star, of course, uh, mm -hmm. so you're looking at the higher, the brighter end of the magnitude range. Uh, but barring those, uh, it's still, you know, it, the, the real intent behind the ABS on it is, is first to, to give you a little understanding of how to do things, mm -hmm. uh, to help you with a project that you really can't do on your own because you don't have the scope perhaps. Uh, so th those are really where those come into use. Uh, and we're more than welcome to have you uh, propose something and we'll see how it will, well it works for you. And that, I put it in a pitch. Uh, we've added this, the, the capability of, of having the grading spectra but we don't have a, a lot of experience. So if somebody wants to come in and volunteer and, and sort out the issues of uh, getting them properly focused and help kind of break the ground, that'd be awesome. And then it would be a much more, we could teach other people and make it much more useful. Excellent. Uh, so in the case of someone who wanted to volunteer to help out, uh, would that need to be someone who lives nearby the scopes that have the the gratings in the filter wheel? No, I don't think so. We're a kind of robotic operation. If you wanted to work with the grading up on the New Hampshire, um, if there's an issue of focus and so forth, you can talk to the operator up there, Arnie, or to mm -hmm. the uh, ABS on that staff. We can do a lot of the adjustments um, remotely for you. Um, it, it could be a fun inter uh, interactive process where you become part of the ABS on that team, really. Mm -hmm. 
And one of the things I'll add, in fact, uh, is that uh, it would be useful to have an individual who might want to work with the spectrum, as George has been alluding to, and, and seeing how to do the reduction yeah. in our spec, for example, mm -hmm. uh, a, a very interesting and useful and inexpensive tool. Uh, so that, that perhaps would be an ideal uh, uh, proposal uh, from an individual out there who's interested in helping, not just taking them because we handle most of that. Uh, in fact, we handle most of the focusing issues uh, as we should, uh, but getting them analyzed in an efficient manner uh, is something we haven't spent a lot of time doing and would appreciate it if somebody would speak up and propose that they'd like to do that. Excellent. All right. Um... Let me see my list of questions here, if we've got anything else on the list. Um, oh, yes. OK, so uh, this one is addressed to Mr. Walker. Um, what software are you using for centering the star on the slit and then guiding it? That's, uh, that we haven't attempted yet to do. Uh, that's one of the next tasks. Uh, but to answer your question, uh, I've managed to uh, talk Bob Denny into uh, writing a module for ACP to do uh, um, that. And it will probably be uh, a matter of taking slewing to the object, doing a plate solve, then taking a second slew to adjust to be in the center. And uh, um, then we would, with these mounts, you, you almost don't have to auto guide after that. But uh, we may find that we have to uh, every so often do a plate solve and an, an adjustment to keep the star in the slit. Okay. All right. But Thank by you. By the way, the, these mounts have these very high resolution encoders. And so these are not like what we're used to seeing in, in, in the amateur world as far as uh, tracking and, and pointing performance. So the, that, that technology uh, is, is what really has enabled this whole project to, to be even a possibility. So. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So um, this is the last one, unless anyone else from the audience would like to submit a question while well, this one is being answered. I wanted to go ahead and try and uh, inspire people to start taking advantage of at first these grading spectra and then the bright spectral robot once it's available. Um, so if any of you have any suggestions for the kind of uh, science that you could be doing with spectra of these kind of resolution and limiting magnitude. When I first uh, became interested in spectroscopy, one of the great difficulties that I encountered was that I didn't know what I should be looking at because I didn't know what would be useful. So do any of you have suggestions? No quick responses. <laughs> no, in fact, most, most of the time, we do hope that people come up with ideas for their proposals. Mm -hmm. We're not really in a position to uh, recommend those things on a general basis, at least from my point of view. Uh, it's a tool that individual members can use for projects they're interested in. Uh, so, you know, be, beyond, you know, teaching yourself a little about photometry and seeing how uh, images are collected on a robotic system, uh, we'd sort of expect that people would, would come up with some ideas and they can be as simple as, we, as we've mentioned, uh, helping with a campaign that already exists on the AVS ONET. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so that's my point of view. Okay, thank you. Well, um, if no one else has any suggestions, then I will just say that um, one potential uh, campaign, if you're interested in starting to uh, work with these spectra, but you're not sure what to shoot, um, there are quite a few bright uh, red supergiants, uh, which could, they are quite uh, spectra, spectrographically variable in the depth of their molecular bands. And that is a uh, kind of very useful data. Um, they're an area of active study in many cases. So uh, red supergiants are a good target. Cataclysmic variables are another um, at the low resolutions and high limiting magnitudes. So there's a lot of interesting stuff that you can 
learn by taking advantage of these resources. Now, I am not seeing any other questions, so I think we're going to go ahead and wrap up the Q and A. All right, let me put up the uh, end card here. Okay. All right, now to wrap up this webinar, I would like to extend a huge thank you to Mr. Menzies, Mr. Silvis, and Mr. Walker for sharing your time and knowledge with us today. I would also like to thank again our sponsors, DC3 Dreams and Voice Astro. DC3 Dreams provides high-end observatory automation and web-based multi-user remote imaging. The AAVS ONET observatories use DC3 Dreams ACP Expert for the Bright Star monitors, which you have just learned all about, and some other programs too. The AAVSO Photometric All Sky Survey project, also known as APAS, has used ACP Expert's AI scheduler to automatically acquire over 500,000 star fields, hands off, at a rate of 1,000 square degrees per night. This has resulted in photometry for over 128 million objects and about 99% of the sky. The Boyce Research Initiative and Education Foundation provides online astronomy education, observatory resources, and research experiences to students, student teams, and schools in order to learn how to perform observations, conduct research, and publish their results in scientific journals, just such as the Journal of the AAVSO. Now, uh, before I get on with the rest of the announcements, I want to remind everyone that the AAVSO's 110th annual meeting is coming up. You can find information about that on our website, big and prominent on the front page. And um, it's going to be held in person in Somerville, Massachusetts. And also there will be online viewing options if you are not able to travel to Massachusetts to attend. So please do check that out. And uh, abstract submission is now open. All right, now, if you are sitting there wishing that you could go back and review some of the details about how to submit a BSM proposal, um, then you are in luck because today's webinar was recorded and the recording will soon be made available for free on the AAVSO's YouTube channel. Go check it out. You'll find a full library of webinars just like these there. And while you are enjoying all of our educational lectures, please consider subscribing to our channel. You'll get a notification every time that we post a new video, and you'll also be making YouTube more likely to suggest our videos to others, helping us increase our educational reach. And that is just one more way that you can help support the AAVSO. Speaking of support, this webinar series is being supported by you, the viewer. So please, if you're not a member, join the AAVSO. It's really a great value. You will get access not only to our mentorship program, but to the BSM Remote Telescope Network, which you've just heard so much about. So you can go ahead and submit your proposals. And then uh, if you are a beginner in the world of photometry and you're not quite sure what to do once you have your data, that's what our mentorship program is for. You can sign up for that and we will help you in every step of the way. And as always, we would be so grateful if you would consider donating to the AAVSO. Every donation matters and goes towards making programs like this one come to life. 